Take your Bibles to Ephesians 3 for our scripture reading this morning. Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll read verses 14 through 21 for our scripture reading, and then we'll pray together, and now we'll move into God's word as we worship together this morning. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. Paul says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Here's the third thing. Listen. That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without him. Amen. One of the things Paul prays under inspiration is that we would be able to comprehend We'd be grounded in love, rooted in grounded love, and be able to comprehend the love of Christ. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this love that gave us joy, saved us from our sin. This love that gave the earth of the birds a gladder song and the earth of a brighter green and the flowers of deeper beauty. Thank you for this love that changed everything. And thank you for this love that never lets us go. Never lets us go. A love that will not end will not cease. It's, it's what we stand on, Lord. It's what we rejoice in. We saw it already in Romans 8 that the Spirit bears with, witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God crying, Abba, Father. That love witnessed in our hearts. What a, what a wonderful relationship, God, that you brought us into. And we look forward to being confident in you and standing strong in you, Lord, and being able to conquer. And so help us, encourage us in that direction this morning, we pray, as we open up your word here in just a minute. But we also want to pause and step back for just a minute and pray for each other. What is the burden? What is the need that we've brought, we brought into this uh, worship service? That, what is it that we've brought in with us as we look to you together in worship? Lord, we know you can handle it. And so just in this moment, we want to pray me out loud, and each of us from our hearts, we want to cast our care upon you, Lord. We want to pray that you'll meet the need, whatever it is, that you, you God, who see the heart, we pray that you'll also meet the need, take care of the need. And our confidence will remain in you, God. We're going to trust you as we pray together this morning. We lift our eyes to the hills, from whence cometh our help. My help cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So, Lord, do your work in, in each life. As we've come together, we know that, that you're, you can help us. We know that you are at work in our lives. And we also pray as we come together from all our different activities and, and things you've called us to in our lives, we come together reminding ourselves we're the church. And we have a message. We have, we have a message. We have a mission. And so we pray together here again. Just gathering in your name, we want to pray and ask that you'll send us out and that you'll open doors and that the, the harvest will be able to be brought in. We'll, we'll be a part of the harvest. We pray that, Lord, that the gospel would go out and that through your people, the church people, would be saved, that, that Jesus Christ would be praised and lifted up and the church would be built. So bless our ministry. We pray for that as we worship together this morning. We pray that, that the outreach and, and individual ministries would be proper. Your hand would be upon us for your work. So, Lord, do your work. Thank you for taking care of us and thank you for using us in your work. And now, Lord, thank you for your word. And uh, open our ears, open our eyes. Uh, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy life. In Jesus' name, amen. So, young people, you're dismissed to your time downstairs. Let's let the young people be dismissed. And as they're making their way downstairs, go with me to your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. In case you were wondering where our study was this morning. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at the last verses of this 
wonderful passage in God's Word, wonderful part of the Bible. Romans 8, we're going to begin in verse 26. And we're going to go down through verse 39. Confident conquer. Let me, let me bring us up to speed. Okay, context. The gospel. You guys remember what Romans is all about? Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That, that's what this is all about. And what is the gospel? The gospel is good news for a lost and fallen world. Why is it good news? Because Jesus sets free from sin's judgment and destruction all who will repent and put their faith in it. The gospel is about the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, which is us. The gospel is about the righteousness of God revealed in Christ. The gospel is about repent and believe, put your faith in Jesus. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The gospel is about now that I'm a child of God, he by his spirit is setting me free from sin. The gospel is summed up, as Paul sums up his first chapters, Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's how Paul at least kind of brings his thoughts to a head here. He kind of brings it all to a, a point that says, what have we seen so far? So he goes on in Romans 8. There's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus because the spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the spirit of of death, so we have the spirit of life, and as we walk in the spirit, we mind the things of the spirit, we, we, we find freedom from sin. Number two, there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, because we are the children of God with a glorious future, that was last week's study. amen, Romans 8 talks about the heirs of Christ, the joint heirs with him, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also what, glorified together. Number two, there's no condemnation because we're children of God with a glorious future. We have hope in the midst of suffering and struggle right now. And number three, Paul closes this summation. There's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus because we are more than conquerors. God has a purpose for our lives in Christ. This is what holds the Christian up. That purpose is to be conformed to the image of his son. And nothing will hinder that work in our lives. And we might think there are some things that are in our lives that aren't going to aren't going to be used. How can this be good, right? Romans 8:28. In our passage this morning, and we know no that all things work together for good to them that love God and them who are called according to his purpose. Look at verse 20, 38. We know, verse 20, look at verse 38. For I am persuaded. We know and we are persuaded, folks. Nothing will hinder God's work in our lives. He who began a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate us. That's the end of the chapter. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. God's work, his good work will be carried out in our lives. No difficulty, no hardship, no struggle will hinder God's work. Now remember the context. That is the big context of Romans 8. Romans 8, even at the beginning, we have life in the Spirit, even though we still struggle with sin. The Holy Spirit is the source of God's work in us to give us victory over sin. Even though we groan in this fallen world, we are the children of God with a beautiful inheritance, a bright future. So even in the struggles, look at Romans chapter 8. And verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Even in the midst of great difficulty and struggle, verse 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. No difficulty or hardship or struggle will hinder God's work. God's purpose will be carried out. We are safe in God's love. We are more than conquerors. That's why there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Because as we close this chapter, God is in complete control. God will do his good work in our lives. So number one, we've got three thoughts we want to see here together this morning in this passage. Number one in verses 26 and 27, we have help in time of need. If you look at verse 25, what does verse 25 say? But we hope for that which we, for that we see not. Then do we, if we hope 
Then do we with patience wait for it. We have hope. Now look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also, what? Help. So we have hope in our struggles and trials. We're looking for the glory to come. We're patiently waiting for the redemption of the body. But we not only have hope, we also have help. Hope keeps us pressing on. And in the same way, verse 26, likewise, the Spirit's help keeps us pressing on. So we have help in time of need. Number one, we have the Spirit's intercession. Keep reading verse 26. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession. You can use the same word pray. This is context. We don't know how to pray, but He prays for us with groanings. He intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Spirit comes alongside us, folks. This is what the Bible says. In our struggles, in our weakness, in our difficulties, the Spirit comes alongside us to help us. And, and by the way, we have many infirmities. What does it say in verse 26? Also help with our infirmities. We're weak in this fallen body. That was the first couple verses before this, where our bodies are groaning and we're, we're in trouble, we're, we're under the curse. What did Jesus say to Peter? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And in our fleshly weakness, we're, temptation comes in. So yeah, there are infirmities, there are struggles, but the comforter is called alongside us to help us. And he helps us in our weakness and struggles. He, how does he help us? Verse 20, 26, he prays for us when we don't know how or what we ought to pray for. Here's the thought. We don't see the whole picture, do we? We don't understand what is happening in the details of our lives. And we don't know how to pray or what to pray for. That's what this verse is saying. We can't see it. We can't figure it out. We don't know what we need. Because we don't know what God's doing all the time. We don't see the big picture. So we pray with limited knowledge. And, and here's the next sentence in my notes. That's frustrating, isn't it? But we're learning to wait on the Lord. We're learning to trust the Lord. We learn to seek His will and to pray in His way first in our lives. God, do your work. I don't understand what's going on, but Lord, do your work. And while we are struggling, verse 26, the Holy Spirit is interceding for us before God. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself or himself maketh intercession for us. The Holy Spirit. This is wonderful help of the Holy Spirit. He takes our burden. He takes our groaning, if you will, and he groans before the Lord. He does know how to pray. He does know what we need. And so he prays with groanings and cries that can't be uttered, verse 26. The Holy Spirit has the right words when we don't. No wonder we can be confident conquerors, because we have this help in time of need as the Spirit intercedes on our behalf in our times of struggle. And here's the good news as we get to number two, letter B. God hears him. God accepts him on our behalf. God's work is brought about in our lives as the Holy Spirit intercedes. What does it say in verse 27 at the end? According to the will of God. This is a wonderful gift to the children of God in our struggles and trials. We have God the Holy Spirit interceding for us with words that can't be spoken. The Comforter coming alongside us to help us in our time of need by praying for us. And he prays according to the will of God. So number two, let it be the Spirit's knowledge. The Spirit's help is profitable and successful because the Spirit knows the mind and will of God. Look at verse 27. And he, that be God, that searcheth the hearts, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. And what is, what's the mind of the Spirit? That's the groanings of verse 26. What he's asking for. Because he, the Spirit, this time. So it's he, God, at the beginning now. He, the Spirit, maketh intercession for the saints. According to the will of God. This is why we can have confidence in the struggle. Because the Spirit's intercession is also built upon the Spirit's knowledge. When we don't know what we are to pray for, how we're to pray, the Holy Spirit prays with perfect knowledge and understanding of the will of God and purpose in our life. Now that's encouraging. You, you, you saw in verse 27 that God searches the hearts. 
God knows my heart. He knows your heart. God sees everything. And as the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings which can't be uttered, he, God, the, the Father, knows the mind of the Spirit. And the Spirit knows the mind of God. The Holy Spirit prays for what God wants because the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. So God hears and understands the Spirit's praying because the Spirit prays according to the will and purpose and work of God. End of verse 27. He prays for the saints according to the will of God. So listen to this sentence I wrote in the notes here. This, uh, this, this helped me. It summed it up for me. What we are seeing here is a wonderful unity in the Godhead that brings about God's perfect work in our lives as his people. A wonderful unity in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit bringing about God's perfect work. We're confident conquerors because we have help in time of need through the Spirit's intercession, through the Spirit's knowledge. God the Spirit comes alongside us to bring about the purpose of God the Father. <laughs> when we don't see everything, the Holy Spirit comes along with perfect knowledge and sight and understanding, and He intercedes. He prays. When we're confused, the Holy Spirit is wise. Amen. This is a wonderful comfort in our struggles and difficulties. The will of God is worked out in our lives as the Holy Spirit prays for God's will to be worked out. It will happen because, number two, God's purpose will be worked out. All things work together for good, and that's verse 28. So number two this morning, number one, help in time of need. Confident conquerors because the Spirit makes intercession for us, prays for the will of God. Number two, confident conquerors because God's purpose is worked out. The Holy Spirit prays according to the will of God, and we know, verse 28, that all things work together for good. We have complete confidence in God's plan and work in our lives. We know that God will be faithful. Number one, do you see that in verse 28? All things. And we know, so there's our word, right? We know that all, confidence, right? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and them who are called according to his purpose. All the details. I, you heard us pastors say, all means all. You know, it's, it's what it means. All can be saved. All the details and all the circumstances of our lives are being worked together for our good. Nothing will come into our lives that will harm us or bring about evil because God will use it for good. So here's the next sentence. Yes, bad things happen. Yes, we are physically harmed and in danger. Just remember verse 36. For thy sake we are killed all the day. But God works through all of those things to bring about his good work. So ultimately, according to the Bible, everything that happens in our lives works together for our good because of God's sovereignty and control. God's in complete control of all things. Nothing happens that is not part of his plan. What does the Bible say here? The Bible says that for those that love God, those who are the called according to his purpose. In our weakness and struggles, we can know that all things are working together for good because we are seeking God. We are loving God with all our heart. He's called us into a relationship with him. And God, I'm after you. I want what you want. And number two, we can know that all things are working together for good because it's according to his purpose. He has a plan. God is at work to bring about his purpose and calling in our lives through every detail and circumstance. So notice letter B, his purpose. It's described for us in verses 20, 29 to 30. Verse 28, according to his purpose. So what's verse 29 say? For we know, for, or for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, he continues to, to under, help us understand this purpose. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Boy, that's the purpose. So yes, all things are working together for good according to God's purpose. And God's purpose is to make us like Jesus. I wrote this in my notes. I want us to get this clear. Let's not get confused on what God's purpose is for our lives. It's not about this life only. It's about being glorified forever in heaven and reflecting the glory of Jesus Christ. 
this thought came to my mind. If I were to put this on the sign, because we love our sign and we want to tell people the truth, and as they drive by, they read this stuff. If I were to put this on the sign, all things work together for good. How many people would drive by and say, man, I'm so glad God's going to carry out all everything. Everything's going to work out perfectly in my life. I'm glad that that sign was up and not, and now I can go through my day with no worries, and they're not even a Christian. See, see, this is true. So I'm not saying it would be wrong for me to put it on a sign. But how many people say, oh, good, everything's going to work out. My job's going to be successful. My family's going to be successful. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to have everything I want. Life's going to be easy. That's not what, what, what this is about. Even for the Christian who would drive by and read it, they should go on with the verse and say, for those that love God, for those that are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, then he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of the Son. You see, it's bigger than this life. My, you've heard this, God's not after my whole happiness, he's after my holiness. It's bigger than this life. God is conforming us to the image of Jesus, which we will one day know being conformed to his image when we see him, for we shall be like him when we see him as he is, right? Yes, all things are working together for good according to God's purpose, and that purpose is to make us like Jesus. Salvation's plan began in eternity past. Do you see what it says in verse 29? For whom he did foreknow. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and the plan of God is that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So from eternity past, God has had this way of salvation set and determined. Jesus Christ, the Savior of all who will repent and call upon him. That's what it means for whom he did for now. God sees his people throughout the ages. God already knew that we would be his child. God has set down Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God, and he has set down the call to repent and believe on him. God has chosen us then in him before the foundation of the world. Because that's been God's plan. That means that every sinner that repents and puts their faith in Jesus has been known of God since eternity past. Boy, that's encouraging. And God's purpose and plan for every child of God will be accomplished. That's the rest of verse 29. Whom he did for, for no, he also did predestinate. Don't get, don't get hung out, strung out and hung up on that word predestinate. It's related to the Christian, not to the unsaved. Our destiny as a child of God is Jesus. This has nothing to do with those who will go to heaven and with those who will go to hell. All can be saved by repenting and believing on Jesus. That's what the Bible says. And all who reject Jesus will go to hell. Their choice. Their choice. That's what the Bible says. Choose you this day whom you will serve. This predestination in Romans 8 is for the child of God. Think about it. Our destiny as God's people is predetermined in Christ. We are appointed for glory and victory and salvation. That's the destiny of the child of God. And here's the comfort, the wonderful news. Nothing will hinder that from coming about because God is God. Nothing will hinder our being conformed to the image of Christ completely one day. Now, I may hinder God's work as I allow sin in my life, and I may hinder that conforming to his image now, but... At the end of the day, here's what Ephesians says, the bride, the body of Christ, will, he will be presented spotless and without blemish. We will be holy and without blame before God in love. We will be righteous and clean and pure. The bride of Christ will be a beautiful bride because we will reflect Jesus Christ. That's our destiny. That's our purpose. Verse 30, we will follow our elder brother in victory. That's the end of verse 29. Verse our future is set because, verse 30, those he did predestinate, same word, those he did predestinate in Christ, then he also called. That was the call to come to him. And for all who accept that call, they receive that call. Then they're brought into that, <coughs> whom he called, then he also justified. That's what this book's been about, justification by faith. Are, are you following along? God called me. By Jesus, God called me to come into a relationship with him because Jesus died to save me. And if I repent 
and accept Christ as my Savior, I can become a child of God. And once I received Christ, God justified me. He declared me righteous in Christ as if I never sinned. And then number three, verse 30, then he also, whom he justified, then he also glorified. Do you see the purpose? Do you see the goal? That's what Paul's after. He's not getting hung up on the, on the parts of the plan. He's, his focus is on the goal. What did he say in verse 28? All things work together for good according to his purpose. Verse 29, the ones he knew are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So verse 30, glorified. This morning, you and I can be confident conquerors because we know what our destiny looks like. <laughs> we're called to come to Jesus, we're justified when we believe on him, and we're glorified as his people. We will be conformed to the image of Christ. Just one interesting note, the words, all these words in verse 30 called justified and glorified are all in the past tense as if they're done. He called us that moment, we accepted Christ our salvation settled. He justified us that moment in Christ. Our salvation settled. He glorified us that moment. Are you with me? Our glorification is settled. It's going to happen. <laughs> so God's purpose worked out. Be confident conquerors because all things work together for good. Because number two is according to his purpose, which those he foreknew, he predestined, he conformed to his son, he called, justified, glorified. And then number three, God's purpose worked out is our confidence. Can anything stop God's work in our lives? If God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God has a plan, who's going to stop him? It's just an interesting question, isn't it? Nobody will hinder God's work. In fact, he's going to say at the end of this in verse 38, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. He gives the general in verse 31, who, what, shall, what shall we say then? If God, who can be against us? And then he gives the particulars in the end there. He says, nothing. So if God, if God has a plan, who's going to stop? Nobody will hinder God's work. God will never give up on his people. He will never let us go. He will complete the work he began in us. What does it say in verse 32? He that spared not his own son, shall he not, but deliver him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who can be against us if God's for us? Number two, what about the work of Christ? That's the foundation of our faith. If he died for me, will not God also through Christ give me everything I need for life and godliness? And, and by the way, the expected answers to these are, are right there in the text. If God be for us, who be against us? Nobody. If God spared not his son, but give him up for us all, will he not also? Yes. Because Jesus is the center of God's faithful work. And in Jesus, in Jesus today, you and I, in Christ, have everything that we need. Our hope is secure. No, so look at verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Nobody can lay anything to our charge as in guilty. It says at the end of verse 33, it is God that justifies. You're declared right in Christ. That's why there's no charge that can come against you. And then he says, sums it up our confidence in verse 34. Who is he that condemn it? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also made the intercession for us. Can anybody condemn us? No, because Christ, what does it say? He died, he rose again, and he's even now at the right hand of God interceding. So there is no, what does it say in verse 34? There's no condemnation because of the complete work of Christ to conquer death, to rise again, eternal life, and to intercede even now before the Father for his people. Confidence, folks, confidence. No one can condemn us. No one can lay anything to our charge. Uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? Confidence. We are set free from condemnation. What does it say in verse 1? There is therefore now no condemnation that we are in Christ Jesus. Jesus conquered sin and death. He lives forevermore, and so will we. We live in him. And by the way, look at the last part of verse 34 again. He maketh intercession for us. And then look at verse 26. The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. We have both of them praying for us. No wonder we have confidence. 
the Holy Spirit interceding, Jesus Christ in his active high priestly work interceding on behalf of his people. So Paul concludes it with this wonderful thought, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So in my mind, it's almost like Paul says, this has been, this has been the foundation. In my mind, it's almost like Paul is talking about the love of Christ throughout this. And the love of Christ that says the Spirit will help us in our infirmities. And because the Spirit's going to pray for, for the will of God. The love of Christ is how all things work together for good. Because God loves his people and he will bring about his purpose. And so in my mind, Paul just says, let's get obvious here. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Underneath all of this. It's, let me put it this way. This is what I wrote in my notes. So if I just read my notes, maybe we'll be okay, right? Underneath all of this, the Spirit's help and God's purpose is God's love for us in Christ. Yes, we have the Spirit's help. Yes, we have the purpose and plan of God. And we have an unending love of God that will guarantee it all to be brought about in our lives. We are in a settled, unending relationship with God as our Father and we are His children. And nothing, nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No wonder we're more than conquerors. So there's not much to say here just to read the verses. Look at verse 35 and 39, because I like what it says, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And then the word love comes up a third time in verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. God's love. God's love never fails. God's love is eternal. Safe in God's love. Persecution, verse 35 and 36. Who separates from the love of Christ shall tribulation. Distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. For thy sake we are killed. All. What's going on, Lord? Nay, verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that love us. So no. Persecution, tribulation, even death will not separate us from God's love. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Brought safely through every trial by God's love. So, verses 38 and 39, we can be persuaded and fully convinced and fully assured that nothing will separate us from God's love. Verse 38, for I am persuaded. Neither death nor life nor angels, principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature. Heaven or, or, or earth or below <laughs> shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. No physical reality can take us from God. No spiritual reality can take us from God. The whole plan and work of salvation is based on God's love. That's what I see underneath God's help and God's purpose. <clears throat> Because he loves his people. And that love will never end. And we'll just grow in that love and rejoice in that love forever in heaven. When the veil is moved and we're not separated and we're not you know, through a glass darkly <laughs> looking at God, we'll be in Christ forever in the presence of his love. And that love will continue to grow and we'll continue to rejoice. For all eternity. What did the hymn say we sang? We are his. And he is, I am his, and he is. So what have we seen this morning? What does God want us to, to, to rejoice in, to, to, to hold on to? What does God want us to grow? What, what does God want to grow us in as his people this morning? We are secure in Jesus. We have a love that will never fail. We are confident conquerors. It's God's love that saves us from our sin. No more condemnation. And God's love brings about his perfect work in our lives. We will be glorified. All things do work together. We are more than conquerors. Let's pray for you. Lord, may each of our hearts be lifted up with that wonderful confidence. And again, we'll leave this building and, because we're not in heaven yet. I, I love this sense of worshiping together that gives us that, that just that kind of atmosphere of heaven. But we're going to leave this wonderful time and something bad. Struggles, difficulties, uh, tribulations are going to come. But we can be confident. And you want us to be confident. Because we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. So 
But Lord, thank you for this wonderful truth, and I pray you'll help us leave with it in our hearts so that we can, we can rejoice in the Lord always, no matter the circumstance. And again, I say rejoice, because if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? What can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Nothing. I am persuaded that nothing can separate us. Give us that confidence, I pray, so that we'll face everything that comes our way with faith and trust and joy in you. In Jesus' name, amen.